If you are looking to procure a new domestic General Motors vehicle in 1959 from either Pontiac, Oldsmobile, or Buick divisions, you are really forced into buying a full-size vehicle or something with a wheelbase north of 120 inches and about 19 feet in overall length. There simply was not a compact car that you could procure from any of those divisions at that time. Chevrolet, however, in 1960 introduced the Corvair, a revolutionary new rear-wheel drive vehicle with a flat-six, air-cooled, opposed engine, something that General Motors had really never done before and was similar in architecture to other foreign makes. For the 1961 model year, Pontiac, Oldsmobile, and Buick would get their version of compact vehicles that did share some similarities with the Corvair, but they were unique in their own way. Of the three divisions getting new compact cars in 1961, Pontiac arguably offered the most radical compact car, and that was the Tempest. Now, why would I identify the Tempest in particular as being very radical? Certainly the Corvair was, as I mentioned before, but the Tempest had a number of elements that were just completely novel, even beyond the Corvair, one could argue. And it's interesting because just a few years prior, Alfred Sloan, who was previously chairman of General Motors, said that he would never espouse doing something for the first time. Well, the Pontiac Tempest had a number of firsts that were different from the Oldsmobile and Buick divisions. The first was under hood, how Pontiac outfitted a different engine to the Tempest, namely half of its 389 cubic inch V8, its so-called Trophy 4 or Indianapolis 4 cylinder that really was half of a 389. It made it a lot easier to service the vehicle as a number of elements like the generator could be packaged in the dead space where the driver's side bank of the V used to reside. And this certainly was no wimpy four-cylinder engine. In fact, as it was half of a 389 cubic inch V8, it displaced a healthy 194 and a half cubic inches with a bore of 4.06 inches and a stroke of 3.75 inches. The engine came in two different forms, one with a single barrel carburetor and 8.6 to 1 compression ratio, making 130 horsepower at 4,100 RPM, and an optional version that carried a four-barrel carburetor, a unique element for any four-cylinder engine at the time, as well as a 10.25 to 1 compression ratio, making 160 horsepower at 4,800 RPM. Doesn't sound like a lot by today's standards, but at the time, that was more horsepower than any U.S. six-cylinder engine even offered, and even for those that had a larger displacement. Pontiac said that this engine would propel the Tempest from 0 to 60 in about 12 seconds, with an automatic transmission, and even faster if the car were outfitted with a stick shift, which frankly was very good for a compact car. Of course, a large four-cylinder engine means a lot of vibration, and Pontiac engineers, including at the time John DeLorean, as well as Bill Collins, who would later go on to become the DeLorean chief engineer at DeLorean Motor Car Company when John DeLorean and Bill Collins met during their time at Pontiac, ended up devising a proposal to mute the four cylinders roughness. One element of this was just simply soft mounting in the vehicle so that the engine could basically wobble under hood relatively freely and isolated the body from those vibrations. Pontiac also tried to quell some of the vibration by precision balancing the crankshaft in the four cylinder to ensure that its dynamic balance was held within very close tolerances and engineers also made sure that the engine's pistons were balanced within one sixteenth ounce of each other. However, another element of the vibration dampening came with one of the strangest powertrain packages that individuals had seen in 1961 and still remains very novel even by today's standards. That was the first domestic vehicle to employ a transaxle. In other words, the transmission of the car was at the rear with the differential and where the drive wheels were. And behind the engine was simply the flywheel and a cover that then was mounted to a drive shaft that joined the transaxle just forward of the rear wheels. 
In the automatic transmission Tempest, the drive shaft would hook into the transmission housing, which contained a two-speed transmission and a three-element torque converter. The automatic transmission being in the rear was air-cooled as opposed to being liquid-cooled like most transmissions of the time. The drive shaft, which transmitted engine torque from the engine back to the transaxle, was a highly unusual piece of equipment, if you will. In fact, the drive shaft was just a slender 5 8 inches in diameter on automatic transmission cars, or 3 quarters inches in diameter for manual transmission Tempest. How in the world could it be so thin? Well, remember that this drive shaft was simply transmitting engine torque unmultiplied to the rear. Drive shafts are often 2, 2 and a half inches in overall diameter because they're coming out of the end of a transmission where the torque has been multiplied by the torque converter. In this case, the torque converter was part of the transaxle in the rear. In fact, all the way in the rear of the transaxle. So all this drive shaft had to do was transmit engine torque as opposed to multiplied engine torque as it would have to do with a conventional automatic transmission outfitted with a torque converter. The drive shaft was also curved, which generated a number of benefits. One was that the hump inside the car was virtually eliminated as the drive shaft with its bowed shape helped clear the car's floor pan. But it also helped dampen some of the engine vibrations as well. The drive shaft was supported by two ball bearings that were encased in rubber isolators and then lubricated and sealed for life. Moreover, this drive shaft was not just a regular old piece of steel, but instead an alloy steel forging that was heat treated and shot peened to resist fatigue. And thus the overall drivetrain was just a very, very strange combination of a half of a Pontiac 389 cubic inch V8 coupled with this rope super thin style drive shaft that was arched or curved and that would transmit the engine torque to a rear transaxle with the torque converter at the rearmost point of the vehicle. Something that you would not expect to see in a compact car and certainly not from General Motors. Of course if you wanted a different engine underhood you could opt for the Buick-derived 215 cubic inch V8 that powered the Buick Special, and a version of it powered the Olds F85, made about 150 horsepower at the time, but then why not get the true Pontiac engine in your Tempest and a super large, I believe the largest four-cylinder engine that General Motors has ever put in a production vehicle. So how exactly did this unconventional drivetrain end up working in the 1961-63 to Tempest? Well, the engine proved very reliable, if slightly rough, despite Pontiac's efforts, and there really were not many issues with the Trophy or Indianapolis four-cylinder in terms of what buyers experienced outside from the aforementioned vibration. When it came to the air-cooled transmission out rear, this was probably the weak point of the overall vehicle, and a number of buyers had issues with it. The rope drive shaft, though, proved to be pretty reliable, although some of the so-called lubed-for-life bearings that supported it did tend to wear out a bit prematurely. But the drive shaft itself, despite being either 5 8 inches in diameter or 3 quarters inch in diameter in the manual transmission cars, seemed to be relatively robust overall. In general, given it was Pontiac's first effort at such an unconventional drivetrain, one would argue that it actually worked pretty well, and customers tended to be happy with this rather reliable engine and transmission combination, again, despite some of the transmission woes that I mentioned. Hope you enjoyed this spotlight on Pontiac's Crazy Tempest and its rope drive shaft. If you did, be sure to like, comment, and subscribe, and check out the video thumbnails at bottom left and right for some suggestions for you.